Man, I'm so excited to be here. Uh, I think we've been, I feel like we're, what do you say, uh, honorary members. <laughs> so this is, not, this is something I love being with you guys. Let me pray first. Uh, I think we need to open up with a word of prayer. Can you guys hear me on the, hear me out there? No, I can't. It's on, Jesse. It's on, okay. Father, in Jesus' name, we just come to you right now. First, we thank you for every father that's represented in this room. Yes, yes. We thank you, Lord God, there are empty seats for the fathers that are here to come. We ask you as, as I go into the stories and, and, and the keys that you gave me to be a father. Yes. That you will open up hearts. That the men in this room who I'm speaking to today yes, will be able to see that they have a part to play. We'll be able to see that the gospel has a way of using fathers more than anything else. And that God, that this word, Lord God, will not sit on deaf ears, but God, it will open up hearts, Lord God, open up ministries in men's lives today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, the main point today, I'm a person, I like to tell you where I'm going, so you know I'm about to end. All right, and some of y'all got that. Today, I'm speaking to fathers. All right. All right, wives, don't go home and start reminding your husband about what I said. All right, so we know that happens sometimes. But first, I want to thank my wife. She's such a great, supportive woman in my life. She pampered me yesterday. I didn't know what to do with myself. She wanted to send me along. She wanted to go with me. And I was like, I just want to spend time with my family. I just want to be with them. But you know, some things, sometimes a, a wife knows when you need some time. And she was doing that for me. And I just, I just, I thank you, Melody, for that. I told her thank you last night, too. So don't, don't think that. But the main point is, we are meant to be fathers. All right. I know sometimes it doesn't feel like that when you're a dad. When you're changing diapers and the baby's screaming and, and you're holding them and nothing's working. But every man has a desire to be a father. All right. I don't care where you're at, what you're doing. How you live your life, you have a desire to be a father. Mm. Because it's that one thing we always want to do, we want to leave a legacy. Yes. So I want to tell you a story, uh, something deep and personal, because I feel like it makes a, a real point about why I'm a father. So Mel had this condition right when she was having our son Keegan, it's called preeclampsia. And it's when the placenta separates and you have to have an emergency birth. So I'm sitting in the hospital at three o'clock in the morning, drinking coffee in front of the doctor, and I was like, all right, we're gonna get out here around six o'clock. And she goes, no, you're having this baby right now. <laughs> I said, you gonna tell my wife that, right? <laughs> so it was a dire circumstance. She says, you have to have this baby right now, or he's not gonna make it. It's 3 o'clock in the morning, there was nobody there. Who am I going to call? Everybody's sleeping. Time is, it's just me, my wife, and the surgeons. So I get up and just get up, I have blue on and everything. And they do this emergency C-section. Mel is woozy, she's got high blood pressure. Uh, everything's, everything's not working right. I don't know if everything's going to go right. Anesthesiologist, like, come in, take some pictures. I'm like, take pictures. I'm worried about my wife. Then all of a sudden, I see it. I see these big feet come on out. Then these big hands come on out. Then all of a sudden, it, you know what happens? He's got this little grunt. And because he was five weeks early, his, his lung wasn't developed correctly. So I saw him for like 30 seconds. I was like, he's beautiful. Then they rushed him off. And then we didn't see him for like another 12 hours. Mel didn't get to see him for at least 24. And Keegan started doing well. People were coming and praying, and all his godparents came and everything. And, and then all of a sudden, we said, man, we get to take him home. You know, they say he's doing well. We get to take him home. And the next morning, the doctor said, hey, guys, he's got to stay. We were broken. Remember, me and Mel went to a room that they had, and we just began to weep. I mean, we both cried. Hysterically. We didn't know what was going on. 
We didn't know what was happening. They said he was doing better. There was no answers. In that moment, we reached a point in both of our lives and both of our hearts where we desired this child. And then I started to pray. And I started to tell God how much I want this kid. How much I want him to be healthy. How much we cared for him. And then the next thing I know, I just knew it right then and there. It clicked. It was like one of those, it was an aha moment. It was an epiphany. I had to lean on his understanding. All my hope, all my faith, and all my reliance in that moment was just on him. Yes. And that's when I knew he was my father. All right. See, I was never taught to be a father. I, was, I never had a good father figure. And I was like, why was God the father? Now, I want to give you just two statistics, and I want these statistics to just, if you're writing something down, you're taking notes, just write these two statistics down. 24.7 million children live without their biological father. 72% of Americans say, our greatest social cause is fatherlessness. All right. That's right. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 4.15, said in so many different ways, he says, yet there are 10,000 teachers, but not many fathers. Right. Come on. And he talks about that. There's a tension. There's these three things that I learned. But I want to say Jesus taught me to be a father through ministry somehow. <laughs> You know, he taught me by, by loving my brother. Mm -hmm. Then being there when young men are vulnerable. Then I had to pray God to show me wisdom. And I mentored young men who were high risk. How me and my wife were just talking about that the other day. We were like, we mentored the broken, most broken men. And we mentored them in that, and I was their father figure. And that was one of the things that I always understood. They needed a father figure. And that's when I came up with this. There are three components to a father. I'm not gonna be with you, I'm not gonna be for you long. So if we can put it on the screen. The first thing is covenant. Now I'm somewhat of a biblical scholar. All right. But I know in Genesis 17, when God visited Abraham and he said these things, he never visited Abraham before. And Abraham didn't have any children. He didn't know what was going on in his life. He was 99 years old when God said these words to him. He said, behold, my covenant is with you. You shall be the father of a multitude of nations. All right. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. Hmm. It's never too late on, to become a father. Right. At 99 years old, when he made a covenant with God, God said, now you can be a father. Yeah. See, the first thing about being a father is you have to have a covenant relationship with God. Amen. You have to be close with him. Because there's something that uh, uh, Bishop Malcolm Smith said that it breaks my heart. It was some of the things he said. It wasn't Eve's fault that Adam ate the apple. He said Adam ate the apple because he wanted to be adult and be insolent of himself away from God and show God that he could be his own man and not be a son any longer. And I could show God that I'm in control of who I am. So he ate the apple. I said, my gosh. I want to be a son. Let me stay a son. <laughs> when you think about these type of things, how all these years we hear those kind of truths that Eve gave no Adam wanted to be him old man. How many of us got sons like that today? Mm -hmm. I know Kiki, he already walking around here acting like he's his old man. <laughs> 
But when I, when I saw that, we had to make a covenant. I see that's the problem with our fathers today. They don't know God. See, yeah, it's something in leadership. I know if you ever you're in leadership, you can't go past your leader. You can't do anything greater than your leader. What Jesus said, he said, he said, I'm your master. You can't go past your master Jesus, but you can teach as he taught. But if you don't have anybody to teach you about covenant, if you don't have anybody to be around you about covenant, if you don't have nobody to teach you about fatherhood, then how are you going to know about this covenant? See, Abraham had to learn on the fly. His first mistake was saying, hey, let me bring my, my nephew Lot with me because I don't know if God can do what he said he could do. <laughs> and so that's one of the things. And then I, was, I, I, I researched this a lot. And I think about who Jesus was and why Jesus came. And if this is for men, this is what men can think of. You know, women love Jesus. It don't take much for a woman to love Jesus. I mean, even they, they think about it. he loves, he just loves, he just, but men need to know that Jesus was a father figure. Men need to know that Jesus represented the greatest father figure that we have ever seen. Men need to know that he was, he was the statue of wisdom. He was the leader of all leaders. He was the friend of all friends. You know, he showed men how to give. He showed them how to fish. He showed them. Listen, I don't care what anybody says. Jesus taking me out fishing and say, this is the last time you're going to fish. You're going to become fishers of men after this. They caught the greatest catch of their life and say, I never need to fish anymore. <laughs> How many of us are fishermen? We got big fish tails. Jesus said, after this, you'll never need to fish again. It was such a great time when we saw this, but Jesus said this. And sometimes I don't think we look at him in this way. Sometimes we don't, we don't look at why, why father figuring is important. But I know you guys are you're on that journey with the journey. Being a father figure is important. He says in the next verse, John 5, 19. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing on his own, but only what he sees the father do. For whatever the father does, the son does likewise. We're all called, men, to be father figures. Yeah. Every single man in this room, even if you're father in that, you got to have a covenant and you have to be a father figure. Yes. You have to do like Jesus did. I only see what God doing. I only speak what God says speak to my children. I only lead the way God told me to lead my children. Because I only do what he told me to do. See, and sometimes we try to lead without God. We try to lead our households without God. I remember when I first got married, I told my wife, I said, you're supposed to be submissive. <laughs> I'm going to just tell you what, I did one, I did one of the cardinal mistakes, Pastor. I rebuked my wife. Uh -oh. I even said it. I said, I rebuke you. She said, you said what? <laughs> I said, I don't know if God told me to say that. <laughs> no, you did <laughs> Listen, I didn't have nobody to show me. You know? I needed a father figure. I needed somebody to show me how to be a husband. I needed somebody to say, you don't say that, son. Wherever you go, don't ever say that again. And so you learn. You learn very quickly what to say and what not to say. And so now I tell my brothers, you better never say that All right. to your wife. There's some things you don't say. <laughs> and so these are the things. I, I had to go through some things. Now, I have a father. He lives far away. My parents were divorced when I was six. And he wasn't around very much. I don't think I got to know him until I was 17. And I was already moved out of my parents' house. And I was already living on the streets. And I was already doing what I wanted to do. I was like Adam. I was living on my own accord mm -hmm. without wanting to seek God's approval. Mm -hmm. And so that's what happens when we don't have father figures. That's what happens when we fathers say, I don't think I got the time for that. Mm -hmm. Come on. 
I don't think I, I, this is the place for me. Well, that's not my son or my kid, so it doesn't matter to me. One of the things that I've taken up is that these are our kids. All right. That's right. Yeah. These are our kids. And we have to understand that, that when we say we're a father figure, we're a figure of only one father, and that's God the Father. Amen. And so the third thing that we got to go, as I talked about Malcolm, and as we become sons, fathers, you got to remember that you're sons. See, something's about us remembering who we were yeah. when we're raising our kids yeah. or being a father figure. Yeah. Something about remembering that you're a son. Yeah. Something to remember about, remember when you were a son. Yeah. Whether you were a good son or a bad son. A mischievous son or an obedient son. You have to remember who you were when you were a son. Because this is what it says in Romans 8.15. Because I think sometimes when we see kids today, this is where we go. <laughs> it said, for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. I used to run with kids who carried guns on BMS bikes. And they were gang affiliated, they were dangerous. And that was their last hope before they went to prison with my mentorship program. And I said, I can't be scared. My wife was like, don't ride in the car with them. I took 15 of them to a campground in Michigan with just me and another chaperone. I said, I can't be fearful. I can't go back. I said I'm going to be a father figure. See, sometimes when we come into these situations, we say, man, I ain't dealing with them. I ain't dealing with those kids. I'm not talking to those kids. I'm not sharing with those kids. These are the good kids. I remember these kids at church. They're the good kids. They know how to listen. But then we got these kids over here. We're like, I don't know about them. I'm going to leave them alone and let, let the system handle those kids. Because we get fearful. We get scared about what will happen. What will be the backlash? What will be, what will be the situation that happens when we're, when we're trying to raise these kids? Is what we're doing impactful? Are the words we even say and falling on deaf ears? When I was mentoring the kids, the first thing that came up that it, I call it, it's called the kettle effect. You know when you put the, the kettle on the stove and you start to heat things up? The steam starts to come out. And so that's what happens when you mentor kids who don't have fathers. It's called the kettle effect. And so you start, you start bubbling, the molecules start moving, so starts moving in their life. You start telling them about Jesus, you start praying for them, then all of a sudden the, the steam starts coming up. Stuff that comes up to the forefront. I found out one kid was molested, many of them were. One kid, I said, why are you acting the way you're acting? You know better than this. And he just started crying. He said, my grandfather died two years ago. And there's nobody around. You're the first person to talk to me like this. A father figure. Yeah. See, sometimes we're fearful to step into these relationships. Because we don't want to be hurt ourselves. Or get hurt. We want our families to be protected if we bring this kid around. But God says, don't step back into fear. Because you have received the spirit of adoption. You as sons have the right and responsibility and authority to be father figures. And this is where it comes. He says, where we cry, Abba, Father. See, there was a whole, a whole thing I wanted to do with you from Genesis all the way to this. But we got to remember that God wants to have a close personal relationship with every man in here. That's right. God wants to walk with you in the cool of the day. God wants to speak with you in a way that he's never spoke with you with anyone else before. He has a specific tone he wants to have with you. He wants to call you son in your prayers. He wants to respond to your prayers. He wants to have a response in your household. When I think about Abraham, Abraham did three specific things. He went where God told him to go. 
He had his son. He was willing to sacrifice his son. But you know what? Abraham was a giver. And that really shocked me when we talked about the father of all nations. He found somebody to give to. He found Melchizedek. He said, let me give 10% of my life to you. And that's what we have to do as fathers. We have to give to at least 10% of our life to someone else. And I know that right after this we're going to have a, a song, but I want to charge you. Man. I want to charge you to say yes to Abba Father. Yes, yes. I want to charge you today to say yes to being a father figure. Not just to your son, but the sons in your neighborhood. Come on. Yeah, come on. I want to charge you and say yes to be a son of God and say, God, I, don't, I can't do everything, but let me lean on your understanding. God, I won't be fearful of this kid, even though he's bigger than me. <laughs> even though he seems a little bit more dangerous than me. Even though he dressed different from me or looks different from me, talks differently than from me. I'm a father. Yeah. I'm going to cry. I'm going to say yes to you. Let me just pray. Father, Abba, Abba, yes. we cry to you today. Yes. We cry to you for the 72% for the of America that thinks that they need fathers, yes. that know that they need fathers. We have not done enough. But Father, today we want to respond with a yes. We want to change our heart right now. We want to change the posture of our being. To be fathers and father figures. To search out sons like God does. To seek and save the lost ones. To call home the prodigal God. So that when we cry, I'm a father. We're doing it in obedience to a yes in you, God. God, we ask for your grace today. Even as fathers are being celebrated and hugged and treated well, let's not forget there's 27.7 million kids today who don't have a father to celebrate, who don't have a father to hug, to make a card for, to dance with, to eat with, and we ask God that we would say yes to them. And be their Abba. God, show us, God, in this next season, even through the journey, how we can reach the kids outside this church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.